All right, I'm going to give a practical demonstration now of the Isnad Kumatan analysis. So as you can see here, I have a giant diagram of every single version of a particular hadith. This is the hadith that I uh, researched in my PhD thesis, which is the famous hadith about the marriage of Aisha to the Prophet when she was at a young age. And so this is all the different sort of variations and transmissions and iterations of that hadith. And so I've put them all together in a giant diagram and we're gonna sort of zoom in in a moment and look at them close up and look at the sort of the textual relationships to actually sort of see the Isnad Kumatan analysis in practice. Now, what I won't be doing now is explaining how to find versions of hadiths nor how to actually make the diagram because we could just be spending like two or three hours doing that. So I'm going to assume that you actually have all the material already collected or collated and sort of laid out in front of you. I do recommend trying to put it into a diagram because it's going to make things much easier. If you can see texts just laid out side by side, you can much more clearly and readily and easily just see how similar they are and how different they are, what's being added, what's being omitted, etc. Just at a glance, when you have them side by side in sort of like a synoptic fashion. Whereas if you're looking at one and then you like you read one entire hadith and then you read another entire hadith and then you read another entire hadith, you've already forgotten what's in the first hadith, right? Unless you have it all memorized, you know, perfectly in your mind. Otherwise, you're going to forget what you just read, you know, a few hadiths back and you're going to miss the relationships. You're going to miss the... Um, sort of correlations and so on, you're going to miss, you know, omissions and additions may not be as obvious, etc. That's why I really advocate this sort of new kind of uh, diagram that I've pioneered here, which I pioneered for my PhD thesis and my other articles, which is having not just the asnads, but also having the matun. Okay, so at some point I'll make, you know, tutorials or whatever, or go into more detail another time about how to actually make these diagrams, how to find the, the hadiths and so on, and, and all that sort of stuff. But for now, I'm going to assume that you have the material in front of you, and then we're going to actually go ahead with how we actually analyze it, how we're inferring, you know, how are we how we're re identifying relationships, inferring, can, you know, uh, uh, ancestry, reconstructing, underlying redactions. That's what we're going to explore now. All right, so um, let's zoom in now and let's have a look at some of these texts. So here we have uh, the common link for a, a good chunk of this material, Hisham ibn Urwa who receives the material, according to him, from his father Urwa, and in some versions also, in turn, from Aisha. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these uh, transmissions. So here we have a partial common link, Ja'far ibn Suleiman, and he's a Basran Hadith scholar. And he transmits you know, his version of the Hadith to two students, and then we have the transmissions branching out from there. And these are the texts. And so if we actually look at the transmissions that are ascribed to Ja'far, and we actually look closely at the wording, we discover something very interesting. There is variation. There is virtually always at this level variation in the wording at minimum. And we're also going to see some other you know, more substantial differences as well. For example, over here, we have this element about how Aisha was playing, used to play with her friends. And then the prophet would come in and, you know, they would sort of be shy and so on. It's a variant of that element. Uh, and none of the other transmissions from this putative source have that. So already, immediately, we can see a major variation here in the material. So can we assign these texts or some sort of underlying uh, redaction in the material, some part of it, back to the putative common source? Well, let's look closely. There is variation. But there's actually, in most of this material, ascribed to this recent common source, this partial common link, there is a distinctive combination. And that is, in this version of the material, in this iteration, what we have is this unusual formulation. In most of the others, it's a hal clause. It's the messenger of God, or the prophet, married her, or married me, when she was a girl of you know, whatever, or when I was a girl of whatever. 
but in this version there's a different um, there's a different structure in the first element, which I have here highlighted in red. And this in here, rather than saying something like Tazawajani Rasulullahi wa ana bintu sabi'i sanin, what we instead have is Tazawajani Rasulullah, or in one version, Tazawajani an Nabiyu, li sab, or li sabi'i sanin. So we have this li rather than the usual hal clause. And that's very distinctive. And what we also have, if you look closely, is in the consummation element, we have wadakhala alayya, or wadakhala bi. So we have this comp, and then again, not a hal, but the li, li tis'i sanin. So what we have here is a distinctive set of characteristics in this material. You can, across the whole corpus, you can find one or two other versions that use the li. But this particular combo, where there's this consistent usage of li, and there's the uh, the element or the variant of married at seven, rather than married at six, or married at six or seven, and also there's dakhala. So we have this particular constellation of multiple uh, uh, recurring elements in all of the material. Again, not all of it. There is some variation. This version, notably, you know, has some different wordings and so on. But overall, in the material ascribed to the common source, we have a distinctive sub-tradition. The partial common link correlates with a distinctive sub-tradition, a distinctive combination of elements, a unique combination of elements. And that is consistent with the material embodying and reflecting the distinctive paraphrase or rewording the distinctive redaction from the partial common link. And so by then sort of comparing these, we can actually reconstruct the original wording of the partial common link. And so we can infer based on this that he originally said something like, حَدَّثَنَا هِشَامُ بْنُ عُرْوَى عَنْ أَبِيهِ عَنْ عَائِشَ قَالَتْ تَزَوَّجَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ or possibly an nabiyu li sab'i sanina wa dakhala alayya or possibly b li tis'i sanina now we can also see that there's been some sort of likely interpolation here none of the other transmissions at multiple registers contain this final element here and in fact if we look elsewhere in the material we find that Ja'far ibn Sulaiman transmits another separate hadith about how Aisha was playing with dolls from Hisham that does not contain the marital age elements. So it's clear here that this transmission, which is recorded by Ibn Sa'ad, this transmission is actually interpolated or contaminated. Someone has spliced in other material that Ja'far transmitted elsewhere from a separate hadith into this hadith. And we can tell that just immediately by finding out that not only does the alternative transmission of Abu Awana from Muslim Ibn Ibrahim not contain that element, but then in turn, this further parallel transmission recorded by an Nasai from the even earlier source also doesn't have it. This addition is absent from multiple registers. And just to sort of signpost ahead, this is a good example of where you know, for secular scholars, that's it. This is just an addition. This is an interpolation. This is a contamination. It wouldn't matter if Ibn Sa'ad was thiqa and if Muslim was thiqa and so on. This wouldn't make any difference. There's no special allowance made in Isnad Kumat analysis for ziyadatu thiqa, for the, you know, additions of people who were deemed to be reliable, for example. If it's in like an out branch, an outshoot, and it's not shared by other branches of the material, then it clearly is just an addition. It's clearly something that is entered into the material at some kind of secondary phase of development. We can actually duplicate what we just did for Ja'far ibn Sulaiman for numerous partial common links within this material. So just at a glance, you can immediately see, for example, that all of these transmissions from Abu Usama have the same set of, most of them, have the same set of elements in the same order, and actually very similar wordings as well. And then, if we, for example, turn to all of these transmissions from Ali ibn Mushir, again, we find 
the same set of elements and often the same wordings as well. So again, we have a distinctive sub-tradition. But you'll notice even these two, which are quite similar, there are differences. So for example, in the redaction of Ali ibn Mushir, or maybe I should say in the sub-tradition ascribed to or associated with Ali ibn Mushir, we find that the consummation element normally occurs at the very end of the hadith. But if we instead turn to the very similar sub-tradition associated with Abu Usama, for example, we find that instead the consummation element is given near the beginning. And so even these very similar sub-traditions retain respective distinctive characteristics. And so we can just keep doing this all across the material. And we can even do this at, the, at a higher register. So right now we're just looking at all the different distinctive partial common link sub-traditions, but we can also find that there is a distinctive tradition overall associated with the common link vis-a-vis -vis others. So if you go through all the material from Hisham ibn Urwa, for example, this putative common link, we actually find this same basic set of elements that Aisha was married or engaged to be married at age six or seven and consummated in marriage at age nine, associated with Hisham ibn Urwa, and especially that vague age range of six or seven. That is distinctive in the material associated with Hisham ibn Urwa. So we have this distinctive sequence and wordings that correlate specifically with Hisham ibn Urwa, the putative common link. And then if we turn to another putative common link, for example, uh, Al-A'mash, Sulaiman ibn Mihran Al-A'mash, we find in turn another distinctive overall tradition correlating with him. And in this one, the marital engagement occurs at nine, not at six or seven. And then there's also a mention of how old Aisha was when the prophet died or in other versions, how long they lived together, which sort of relates similar material. So you have this distinctive sequence of elements, which is marital engagement at nine and then an element about how long the Prophet and Aisha lived together slash how old she was when he, when he died. And so this material in turn correlates with this overall description to Al-Amash. So we can clearly see again what we were doing for the partial common links. In this case, we can duplicate for the common links. And we clearly have, just as we have this distinctive sub-traditions associated with the partial common links, we have overall distinctive traditions associated with the common links. And so basically, we just keep on doing this until we hit the earliest point at which either we find a correlation or the correlations break down. And this actually happens in the case of this hadith for Aisha. If you actually reconstruct the earliest versions of this hadith, for example, the hadith of Hisham ibn Urwa, it's not even ascribed to Aisha. What you'll notice if you go through carefully is that buried amongst the material are multiple versions that do not even cite Aisha herself. So for example, the version preserved by Ahmad al-Utaridi from Ibn Bukair, or this version preserved by Ibn Sa'ad from Waqi'ah. Likewise, this version preserved by al-Bukhari from Qabisa from Sufyan al-Thawri. These sort of fossil ascriptions, these more archaic types of ascriptions preserved across the material indicate that in the original version that was disseminated by Hisham, he actually did not even cite Aisha herself. So Hisham actually cannot even be counted as a transmission from Aisha because clearly in his original iteration of the material, which he then altered through successive redactions, he did not actually cite Aisha herself. And so if you actually gather up the material and those versions that are ascribed all the way back, for example, to Aisha, she's not a common link. There is no distinctive redaction that can be correlated with her vis-a-vis -vis other iterations of the material. And that's the Asnad Kum method analysis in a nutshell. We try to collect all the material and then collate it and sort it out, put all the putative transmissions from common sources next to each other, compare them all, compare all the material to see if we have distinctive sub-traditions, and we check to see if those sub-traditions correlate with commonly cited sources, if we have genuine common links and partial common links, in other words, and we just repeat this process 
and try to reconstruct the underlying redactions of the partial common links and the common links as far back as we can. And eventually we'll hit a point which may be an epistemic point. We just don't have surviving material that would show earlier common links, or it may be the actual point at which the material originated. Both are possible. And, but we hit a point eventually where we can no longer reconstruct anything earlier from any earlier commonly cited sources. And that could be the case either because there is no earlier commonly cited source or because what we have just doesn't embody a distinctive redaction of the material that correlates with the commonly cited source vis-a-vis -vis other iterations of the material.